Welcome to the Lynn Journals podcast uh, for end of the year celebration. This has been, I guess, our second episode. So this is now an annual tradition. We're going to talk uh, bests and busts. So our our favorite products and our least favorite products of the year. We've got sort of a round table here uh, and I'll, I'll start in the order that I guess we're going to talk. Allie Acock Patterson, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, Zach Sutton, our blog editor, is also joining us. Good morning, Zach. Good morning. And Roger Sakala, who you probably know if you've listened to this podcast. Uh, Roger, good morning. Good morning. I, I want to start with the bus just to get the negativity out of the way. We'll we'll move into the new year with positive energy, but we'll start this conversation with negative energy. And I want to start with Allie. What is your least favorite product of the year? So I really had a hard time with this one because there were so many challenges for so many manufacturers, obviously. So I went with something that cannot really be faulted to any of the circumstances of the world right now. And that is the Atom is Neon. And the reason I say it can't be factored, you know, it can't be blamed. The pandemic cannot be blamed for anything is because it was supposed to come out last September. So the fact that it just came out, I don't know, first week of December, probably, and there's no accessories available. So 14 months late. Which might actually be a record of how fast they actually got it from their announcement. But They've already discontinued the larger models. So we've ordered the 17 inch and the 24 inch. We only have the 17 inch right now. And then also there's no media bay or inputs or outputs other than a DC input. Uh, You have to build these expansion units onto it to get HDMI inputs and outputs and then SDI inputs and outputs. And finally, the last dumb thing is if you want to change any of the settings, you have to have an app and it is iOS only. Uh, I want to back up real quick. So you're saying that they just released these and they've already discontinued the bigger model? They've only released the 17 inch, which doesn't even have a 4K display. Um, the 24 inch does. It was supposed to come out this uh, this month, but it has not yet. And I think the 51 inch and maybe the 30 something inch, the 51 inch is definitely already discontinued. Wow. I didn't realize the 17 inch wasn't a 4K monitor. That seemed to be kind of the only defining factor of this line is that they're finally releasing like 4K studio capable like reference monitors. Yeah, no, it can record 4K. It cannot display 4K. That's a problem with like Atomos specifically, but I think the industry in general, and we have covered this in multiple topics on multiple different episodes, uh, the tendency to sort of announce a product and then figure out how to make it and just take pre-orders and release marketing material for a year or two and just kind of hit the ground running and solve the problem afterward. Right. Uh, And that's a really unfortunate tendency in the entire industry. It sucks. And I feel like Adamus is particularly bad about it. Yeah. Like I saw this thing in person in a Pyrex cube. Like they always have, you know, if anybody who's been to NAB, you're going to see a lot of products that people are very excited about in Pyrex cubes. <laughs> uh, so you can't touch this thing. Can't really ask us many questions about it, but here it is. And we're taking pre-orders. Give us your check and you can have this thing whenever it exists. And Or doesn't. Uh, right, exactly. In a lot of cases, doesn't. Or doesn't, at least in the form that they're marketing it as. Right. You'll lose features or... Features will be coming in future firmware updates, future being very nebulous and not defined in a lot of cases. Right. I would say for anybody who's looking into this kind of stuff, and maybe not even filmmakers or photographers, people in general, good rule of thumb, don't pre-order anything ever. Yeah. It's a loser's game. You're paying for research and development. Wait for the thing to be released and see if it's any good or not. Sometimes you're just paying for you to be able to do the research and development. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. basically Kickstarter without Kickstarter fee. Right. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. I guess we'll, we'll move on to the next, (laughs) the next negative in the line. Uh, Zach, what is, what is your least favorite product of the year? Uh, So my least favorite product is sort of a collection of products. And I kind of was like Allie, just kind of like trying to figure out what I wanted to choose for my least favorite. And I ended up going with, the Nikon Z series as a whole. Cameras and lenses? Cameras and lenses. I just, you know, Nikon Nikon really seems to be struggling these last few years. Sony and Fuji are really just like running the uh, 
the mirrorless game and Canon, you know, it took them a little bit, but the R5 is incredible. And with Nikon, I just feel like they they don't have their attention on the Z series. And I feel like they needed to really, really make a big push this year. You know, for example, the Z7 II uh, still is not released or, you know, it's in very limited quantities. It is spec for spec less superior to both the Canon and Sony counterparts. Is, is um, less superior the same as not as good as? <laughs> Yeah. That that would be correct. Yeah. And I had a lot of hope for the Z series, you know, when they first came out because Nikon came out with that uh 58 millimeter F1 or F.95 lens, which is an incredible lens. You know, I know that they weren't ex- they expected it to be like a specialty lens and they overshot their pre-orders and and everything and it just felt like they were going to be coming out with interesting and unique products for their Z series. And then that was the last interesting thing that they've put out on it. They've hit the mirrorless systems for two years now, and I'm just still not very impressed with what they have to offer. I'm curious, Zach and Roger and Ali too, if you think that there's a video niche. This is a pretty broad question, but how do you think Nikon can fix its current situation? Nikon, historically, you know, there was a time Nikon was their lenses at least were the video lenses. People use them on adapters and largely because of the mechanical uh, aperture control, but people wanted Nikon lenses for video 10 years ago and Nikon just kind of let that go by. And now they're trying to get back in and they can, you know, make video capabilities, but it's kind of late. The the ship sailed. Mm -hmm. I hate to be a Nikon apologist, but I kind of admire a lot of what Nikon has done in the business sense, they have downsized amazingly, Mm -hmm. maintained profitability while they did so, but they have had to let a lot of people and facilities and things go. I sound that as negative, but I'm saying it in an admirable way. They've had no choice and they've done it well. But the downside to that is they are left with a smaller staff. And I think not so much they chose to do all this as they have a limited number of engineers and designers, and they're trying to do what they can, still fighting a two-front war with SLR and mirrorless, and they don't have the resources that their competitors do. Yeah. Well, I I agree entirely. I think in order for Nikon to really survive and push to the mirrorless platform, you know, we're still in this early stage with Nikon and Canon where third-party lens developers haven't really put out anything for them. You know, Sigma, Tamron, et cetera, et cetera. They're not producing these lenses yet. So Nikon either has to go one of two ways. They have to be either incredibly aggressive on getting sort of the staple lenses out so people can adapt to that new platform, or they need to create interesting and unique lenses that can only be found on that platform. And like I mentioned earlier, the eighty or the 58 millimeter F.95 is one of those unique staple lenses that you can only find on a Nikon mirrorless. But in terms of their staple lenses of just like lenses that you have to have, you know, their fastest 85 millimeter is F1.8, which is fast, but like all of the competitors have something faster. They don't even have a 24 to 105 millimeter lens, which generally speaking, is not a lens I care much for anyway, but it is sort of one of those staple lenses that a lot of people use for video and and everything else. You know, the majority of their prime lenses are F1.8 when Canon and Sony have F1.4s, and they don't have much in the way of telephotos. You know, they have 270 to 200s for the Z series, and then they have a 50 to 250 millimeter. And, And that's it. You know, they don't have anything that could appeal to wildlife photographers, to sports photographers, or anything like the sort. And I think they just need to be really aggressive on developing these lenses because everybody agrees that mirrorless platform is the future of, you know, the photography world. And if you're going to try to shift your business and your market to mirrorless, you have to do it very, very quickly because you're already years behind the competitors with Sony and Fuji. Uh, I will move on to the next thing on the list, uh, which I have myself next in the outline. And I want to put on my tinfoil hat here uh, for a second (laughs) and complain that uh, my bust of the year is that the Oculus Quest 2 requires a Facebook account uh, to use. So 
a little bit of history. Oculus was not started by Facebook, the company as a whole. Uh, it was um, started as an independent company and then purchased by Facebook a few years ago. And at that point, a lot of people were worried that uh, there was going to be some sort of um, required integration like this. And Facebook mm -hmm. came out and said, no, we're not going to do that. Don't worry. Oculus will operate independently. Uh, and then at this point, they announced this year uh, that the Oculus Quest 2. So if you're a new user of this thing, you have to start a Facebook account if you don't have one to, you know, register your Quest 2 and to purchase any content. If you already own a Quest or a Quest 2, you can merge your existing account to a Facebook account. And that is going to be a requirement starting in 2023. So hypothetically, if you bought a Quest 2, before this announcement, don't want to have a Facebook account and don't want to merge your existing Oculus account with a new Facebook account, you cannot use your Oculus starting in 2023. It's a it, it's useless. It's a paperweight. But by then we'll have like the Oculus four or five, right? Right. Which will require, <laughs> I'm sure, your blood type and your social security code. <laughs> It's fascinating to me that that is the route that they went. You know, given this year, we've had documentaries. Uh, what was the one on Netflix that was uh, the social? Right. I can't remember what that was called either. I will look that up and we'll put it in the, in the show notes. But yeah, it is the social something. And, and, you know, there was The Great Hack, which was another great documentary on it. And everybody, you know, at least from my experience, everybody during this year in this pandemic has just gotten more and more frustrated and less trusting of social media platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. So for you to create a product and then require you to have an account on a social media platform in order to use said product just seems like a, a huge oversight and just, yeah, kind of arrogant in design. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I, I think at this point, it's really not it's not a debate whether Facebook is like an active problem in <laughs> culture. It, I think most people, even Facebook users, would agree that this is overall a problem. And even if you're not, you know, saying I need to eliminate this from my life and this needs to not be a part of culture, you're at least saying, OK, we we should probably approach this differently. Right. And you know, to be fair, an iPhone or whatever will require you to have like an Apple ID. Many, many products require you to kind of like register an email address. But this is a definite step past that point, because to start a Facebook account, you have to give them your real name. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to give them at least some degree of personal information. You can't use a VPN. So by default, you sort of have to give them your location. It's a bigger ask, I guess, is what I'm saying, than, than registering your email address with a company. You're sort of registering your identity with a company, which is scary, especially with a company that at this point is like an, an acknowledged evil. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the last thing in the list. Roger, uh, what is your bust for the year? Uh, Canon T8i, and it, it, it's not even worthy of a bust. It's just a... I was about to say, this is kind of a weak one for you, Roger. It is, but it's just like... The amazing question to me is why it's uh, it's not even a triumph of technology over common sense because it's got no technology of note. It's like a throwback to the days when camera companies a decade ago made intro leader cameras to get you know people their first SLR and put them in the pipeline. And that's dead and gone. Mm -hmm. Why anybody is buying a T8i right now, I can't even imagine. And so it's, it's kind of just this awesome, why did you bother? And no one cares. They were cleaning out the warehouse probably and went, oh, shit, we forgot to release this one. <laughs> it's about what it looks like is, oh, we, we made this. We might as well send it out. Like you said, it's sort of marketed to a demographic that maybe doesn't exist anymore, which is like beginner photographer who wants something a little bit better than their phone. What would you want in a camera that is meant for that demographic that you're not finding in the T8i? That it be mirrorless. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Not be legacy technology, which is basically what this is. I get asked several times a week, you know, from people that are like, I want to buy a decent camera to take photos of my friends, this, that, this, that. What should I get? And I never know how to answer that question. Well, you know, you know what, what my answer would be today would be the same as it was a year ago, a T7i. 
Yeah. See, I, I used to always recommend the T whatever I, you know, the latest one or a rendition yeah. before that, um, because that's just like what I was familiar with as sort of the like intro camera. But I don't even recommend that anymore. You know, I had a friend just the other day saying that they wanted a camera that was better than, you know, their iPhone or, you know, their mobile photography camera. And I had recommended the uh, the Sony A6000 series, I think it is. Again, a camera I've never used, but it seems like it always, you know, comes with high praise. And I'm just like, it's, you know, mirrorless. It's not as nice as a DSLR or uh, a mountable um, mirrorless camera, but it is still a really, really great camera and it's nearly pocketable and it has all the features you would ever possibly need. And I, yeah, I think you're right, Roger. I don't think there is this need for the T8i or the T9i or anything like that. I think that Canon really just needs to focus on mirrorless at this point and make that full transition with some intro level mirrorless systems. What I would tell somebody asking that question, and speaking of niches, I think this is where Fuji really excels. Like an mm -hmm. X-T2, a used X-T2 or X-T3 yeah. is right. like a perfect option for that person. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's another great, great camera, uh, great system that is affordable and can do everything that you would need it to do from both simple photos during a vacation to actual, you know, photography, professional level gear. You give you give a kid a T8i and an 1855 kit lens, you're going to turn him off from photography for the rest of his life. Get your kid a T8i and he'll go get a real career. Well, I guess <laughs> I guess my point is not that this is so awful, it's just so useless. Yeah. All right, well we'll take a quick break and uh when we come back, we'll come back with some positivity and right. we'll we'll talk about our best of the year. Welcome back to the Lintronals podcast. Uh, we just ran through all our busts for the year, all our least favorite products, and now we're gonna we're gonna start talking about some nice stuff, some things we like. What are our best products of the year? And uh, I will start with Ali. Uh, what is your first best product of the year? Man, this was also really hard because despite 2020 being kind of a rough year on everyone, there were a ton of great new product releases. One that I'm name dropping, but I'm going to pretend like it's not actually on my list. I wanted to include the 50 to 1000, the Canon 50 to 1000, because we got that this year, even though it's a 2015 lens, but it is so amazing and it's ridiculously huge. Um, and it actually rents all the time, but that's not actually my best. So I'm going to move on to my actual, uh, my actual first best is um, going to be budget anamorphics because we actually saw quite a few crop frames, small, inexpensive anamorphic lenses come out. The first one was Sire. They actually sent us a 50 millimeter 1.8 anamorphic as just a demo copy. Had a chance to test it. And, you know, it's for the price point, we thought it was, uh, it definitely performs a lot better than say like an SLR Magic. Pretty sharp in the corners for what it is. And just a really well-built lens. It uh, is not geared. So it's more of a traditional lens body type. It is fully manual. So they ended up producing it. Um, and now we carry the 50 millimeter and micro four thirds, Sony E and X mount. We also have the 35 millimeter, which has been insanely popular. We have that in EFM mount, micro four third, Nikon Z, Sony E, and both lenses are 1.33 anamorphic. We also carry Vazen, which we just got a lot of requests. It felt like a lot of people requested a lot of lower end lenses this year, but uh, Vazen was another anamorphic manufacturer that we thought was pretty impressive for the price point. Uh, the inexpensive ones, are the 40 millimeter T2 and the 28 millimeter T2.2. And that's a 1.8 squeeze. Uh, both of them have pretty remarkable flares. The Surrey I probably like a little bit more, but the Vazins have like traditional gearing. So from a cinema use point, I think that's probably why a lot of people are asking for that and renting them. Budget anamorphic has been a really problem product category for us for like SLR years. Magic is the worst. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to ask about. So yeah, we have, I can't remember the name of that adapter that I hated that I don't think we carry anymore. The Anamorphex. Uh, do we still carry that? I don't think we do, but yeah, it was awful. I hope not. If we do, I'm not even linking to it in the show notes. That should <laughs> not rent. Um, it's a 114 millimeter barrel diameter. Like it's basically just a clamp on adapter. So um, big and heavy and broke yeah. all the time and terrible bokeh. And it was very difficult to use because you had to focus it. You had to focus it and the lens independently. Right. So yeah, just 
I would not recommend that to anybody. So that was kind of our first budget anamorphic option. And then SLR Magic released some anamorphic lenses that I think we do still rent. We do. But I also would not recommend. Those are terrible. Terrible. Yeah, they're <laughs> very bad lenses. Uh, the Surrey, again, has gorgeous, gorgeous flares, and the bokeh is pretty good. Vazen, uh, the flares aren't quite as good. But if you really want to go for a nice, you know, J.J. Abrams flares from everywhere lens, I'd recommend the Surrey. Perfect. Where would you put these on, like, I don't know, a scale from the SLR magic lenses to the master anamorphics, you know, one to ten? <laughs> Where do these land quality wise, would you say? Uh, Saray, I'd probably say maybe a seven and the Vesa, maybe a five or a six. Which is really great considering the cost. Like those master anamorphics, I don't want to get into the specifics of how much they cost precisely, but right. I remember when we ordered the first kit, seeing the cost and thinking, oh, hey, these lenses as a kit cost more than my house. Yeah, we had <laughs> yeah. to actually consider um, like, changing our insurance just to be able to ship them as sets, I think. Yeah, so they are not cheap. But they are amazing. But price point wise, these more affordable ones are like, where do where do those land cost wise? Uh, the Siri 50 is 700, 699.90. And then the 35 is $799 brand new. Oh, yeah, that's not bad at all. Which may actually be cheaper than SLR Magic. Zach, we'll move on to you next. Uh, what is your first favorite product of the year well my absolute favorite product of the year and it kind of runs parallel to the my my bust for the year and that is the uh, canon r5 it felt to me like the r5 was canon's first real big push into the mirrorless platform where the you know eos r was just sort of a introduction into this new rf series of lenses and so on uh, but I'm, i've been really impressed with how they've been able to come out with a, a new flagship that really, really offers a lot to it. You know, for me as a studio photographer, the 45 megapixels is huge, huge, huge. I shoot a lot of stuff. I shoot a lot of beauty where I like to crop in after I shoot it. And that 45 megapixel sensor gives me that option and kind of starts, you know, it, it's finally a push to really compete with Sony and even Nikon on that regard. Uh, the autofocus on the camera is incredible absolutely amazing they added in body st stabilization and you know it does shoot 8k and it is by and large spec for spec the best camera canon has ever made but that said in its release it was met with a lot of different challenges i mean i still don't own one because i just can't find it in stock anywhere mm -hmm. you know there was Obviously, the big overheating issue with shooting 8K. But that said, I feel like, you know, that was completely overblown. By no means is this mirrorless camera meant to compete on an 8K format with Aries and Reds for, you know, one tenth of the price or, you know, whatever it is. And if people expected to get an 8K camera that can function full, like full function in 8K. Without a fan? Without a fan for under $4,000, uh, they need to quit dreaming. It just doesn't exist yet. Yeah, that's a fight we've been having to have with people since like the 5D2. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I, I mean, I think all of, you know, the, the DSLRs when they started introducing video with that, and then now even with these mirrorless cameras, and certainly with the exception of like the A7S's, which are sort of designed with video in mind, Canon especially has been making cameras that have video function, but, you know, aren't trying to make that as your main video camera. You know, if, if you're looking for a video camera that you can use for vlogging or creating, you know, movies or short films or anything like that, the R5 isn't going to be your camera. And it's, and it's not designed to be that camera. But if you want an incredible camera that has all of the functions that you would need as a professional photographer that can also shoot really, really great video uh, here and there, I think the R5 is incredible. I'll just throw out that the R5 reminds me so much of the 5D2 that Ryan just mentioned. Mm -hmm. because yeah. People hated on that camera for years as it continued to be the best selling SLR ever. Absolutely. Everybody hates it, but you sure can't find one in stock. 
Exactly. And there are like little subtleties that I just love about the R5. And Sony has been doing this for a long time as well. But, you know, for me, I'm a studio photographer. I shoot in studio 99% of the time. I am always tethered to a, a computer when I'm shooting. And with the R5, you tether via USB type C, which is immediately faster, immediately more reliable than a standard USB port. And then also a big thing is that it charges the battery as you're tethered. So I can shoot all day with the R5 and never ever have to swap out batteries, which saves me a lot of time, especially if I have my camera mounted up on a tripod 10 feet up in the air shooting overheads for product work. Uh, the idea that I don't have to change batteries, that I don't have to do these little things uh, saves me a lot of time and a lot of frustration. And it's little things like that that just make this camera like perfect to me. Uh, speaking of the 5D2, if you were to, you know, pick one of these up eventually when you can find one in stock and stick with this system, what would you want, you think, in an R5 too? Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because, and and this is just sort of the rumor mill, but there's rumors going around that they're going to release an R5S or announce an R5S soon, oh, which I think I've that. only... Yeah, I've only read a few little rumors about it, but it looks like they're, you know, it's going to be the same body as the R5. It's going to be even higher megapixel. I think it's like 80 megapixel, which is really impressive. And then it doesn't have the focus of the 8K or a lot of the video functionality. So the one thing that's stopping me from getting an R5, aside from not being able to find it in stock anywhere, is, you know, this tease that there might be an announcement for an R5S soon. Um, because for me, resolution, resolution is a big part of my game. Well, I will move on to the first of my best, and that is the Shure MV7. It makes uh, me which, so happy that that's on your list. <laughs> I love it so much. And surprise, that is the mic I'm recording this podcast with. And for anybody that's unfamiliar, the Shure MV7 is essentially just kind of a digital upgrade to the Shure SM7B. Uh, which is a mic we also just started carrying this year, but has existed since like the 70s. It's, it's been like a go-to standard vocal mic forever. And it sounds great. I've used that to record the podcast before, but there are some little uh, hiccups um, in that one, it's XLR only, obviously. So I have to use like a USB interface, which isn't a huge deal for me, but can be a hurdle if we're like mailing a mic out to our podcast guests, which we're we're doing even more often this year than we had before. And two, uh, its default gain is a little low. So you often have to use a cloud lifter, which is a, a product we have uh, for rent that we recommend in combination. So to get those levels a little bit higher, uh, if you're running just straight XLR into a USB interface. Uh, so great mic, but some like little things that make it a little difficult to work with. It definitely lends itself to like a studio use where you are right. shipping it all over the country all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely kind of designed to be used in like a recording studio where it's not going to move anywhere. Uh, so this SMV7 is basically the same microphone. It sounds the same, at least to my ear. I'm not like an audiophile, but I it thought you were great. on the 7B. So yeah, it, it's essentially the same microphone, but with a little bit of like quality of life improvement. So it's got a USB out, um, so rather than running it into a USB interface right now, I'm running the USB straight into my computer, which is handy. It's also got a little bit higher gain and then level controls right on the mic, uh, which are just run with a little touch screen on the top. Uh, so all in all, it's easy enough that we could send it to our podcast guests, uh, which is what I'm hoping to start doing. I'd love to, not that I don't love the NT-USB Mini, but that's been kind of our go-to default. Um, that's I'm what hoping. I'm on right now. And it's, I feel like it sounds so much louder than yours. Yeah. And it, it's, it can get a little tinny. Uh, and part of that, I, I guess, that. is the fact that it's, um, it's like a desktop mic, the NT USB. Right. Uh, so typically it's like a good foot from your speaker where like, I guess we would ship this sure with a, a mic stand or something, which might be its own hiccup. But yeah, in comparison, Allie, uh, and Zach are currently on the NT USB mini, which is usable. Absolutely. But I don't know. I, I would love to step up our podcasts, uh, remote guest recording, uh, this year and send out more sure MV sevens. And to do that, we need more in stock. 
which means people have to rent it. So please rent this mic, I guess. is the. I also think it's worth mentioning that it also has an analog path if you need it, if you don't want to oh. do the digital option. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, it's got an XLR out as well. So you can use it just as a standard microphone. It's also got its own headphone port, uh, which is really, really handy. I actually think we had an order for like maybe five or six and we had to cancel it because we couldn't get enough in stock that fast. That's been an ongoing problem. All year. Um, Just every every single thing we want to buy, we can't get our hands on. Uh, Roger, we'll move on to you. What is uh, your first best of the year? I'm going to go with a Sony 12 to 24 F2.8, which is uh, kind of a stepping out for me because I'm usually not a Sony lens uh, advocate, but this lens is really awesome. First of all, uh, because I've gotten this on a couple of forums, 12 is really different than 16, and people need to stop comparing their 1635 as a wide. 12 is a hugely different uh, angle of view. But the the big thing is this is an excellent lens uh, at both ends of the zoom range, uh, nearly to the edges, without much uh, in the way of distortion or field curvature for a lens that wide. And of course, for me, it's got some technology involved in it, which Sony is great about cutting edge technology. And sometimes they uh, hit home runs and sometimes they strike out. This was a home run. There's an element in this lens that two years ago, I would have told you could not be made. It's a very severe, very strong double A spheric. And it is so curved that they had to develop a new coating process to be able to coat it, which is pretty cool. This is a, the best ultra wide angle zoom that there is right now. It certainly replaced the venerable Nikon 14 to 24 and really is a good lens. I really love uh, Canon's 11 to 24. I, I guess beyond the obvious focal length difference, how would you, well, the obvious focal length and aperture difference, how right. would you compare it to the 11 to 24? The, the Sony is better at uh, 12 than the Canon is, uh, and it's so much better. It's better at f2.8 than the Canon is at f4 at the edges and away from center. So it's really that good. I only have one hesitation on it since we usually do throw out our hesitations, and that is that it has. A, uh, a front element that's going to be incredibly expensive to replace. So if mm-hmm. you scratch it, it's going to cost you uh, half a lens of repair. I, I will say, though, that, you know, other than, you know, video people need uh, neutral density filters for these. But for those folks who want to put a polarizer on this, just realize you're going to get irregular polarization on, an, on a lens this wide. So it it is not going to have that whole sky is the same color polarization thing. It's just too wide for that. The angle of the sun coming in is going to make the polarization different in different areas. And what is the defining factor of the polarization problem? Is it just that you're seeing more of the filter than you normally would? No, it's the angle of view can change so much. So if uh, you're at 12 millimeters, you've got like a 112 degree angle of view. So the light is coming in at different angles, more severe angles than you're used to. Uh, It it still is going to take care of like reflections, uh, the things that one of the things we want polarizers for, but the other making that really blue sky that you often want a polarizer for, you're going to get different colors in your sky from one side to the other. Sometimes. Is there anything you can do about that in the field or you just kind of fix it in post? I think you have to fix it in post. Which then brings the point about, well, why don't you just fix the whole sky and post and not worry about the polarizer? But that's another issue. Right. That's pretty easy to do now, but that's a whole nother yeah. debate. People love to debate whether that's ethical or not. Yeah. Uh, but that, yeah, that'll be a different episode. Probably never. We'll probably never do that. I don't <laughs> want to have that conversation. <laughs> nope, me either. Shoot raw, fix it in post. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Allie, what is, uh, what is first on your list of best for the year? You mean my your second? Last? I guess we yeah we're we're <laughs> looping all the way back around. Your second best of the year. So, I went with the Bird Dog P4K. Bird Dog has certainly had some ups and downs in terms of firmware and this year, uh, but they're a very small company and they have worked very aggressively to address any of the bugs uh, that they have seen. And at the start of this year, we only owned one Bird Dog product. We own the P200. We now own six products or we added six products this year. And I think we just ordered the P400 as well. But the P4K, I really like because it just feels more like a real camcorder than like a security camera. It's got a 14.4 megapixel one inch sensor. 
It can do 4K UHD up to 30 frames per second. The color space does not look like a PTZ camera. It looks more like, uh, say, the Z90V by Sony. It has just that really kind of cinematic looking tone to it. It also is um, has a lot more connectors that uh, some of the other cameras, like you can actually do Genlock on the P4K. Um, it's got two 6G SDIs, one HDMI 2.0, and of course it's full NDI. So you can transmit your video feed and control the camera all through one cable and power the camera all through one cable. I think Bird Dog's objective is to ultimately kind of make the SDI cable obsolete. But on this camera, they actually have two SDI cables. So I guess that part of their journey is not going real great. But truly, Bird Dog, they are some great guys. I've gotten to know them a lot better this year, just trying to figure out how lens rentals can adopt IP cameras, IP controllers. Um, It was certainly a new thing for us to bring in NDI. And when the pandemic hit, everybody needed it. (laughs) And uh, we weren't really up to speed. A lot of the firmware stuff wasn't up to speed. But like I said, they were very aggressive. They acknowledged that they made some mistakes. They took it head on and they're really some good guys. And I I look forward to future products of theirs that we will carry. It's funny that, you know, with with all this happening, remote remote production has, you know, we've had a lot of increased demand for that. And I feel like we have a lot of different solutions at a lot of different price points, but nothing yet that feels like it's totally fully there and nailed 100% and ready to go. It, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, I think we're all still trying to figure it out. But, um, you know, I kind of liken it to when we got gimbals for the first time. We just, you know, it's kind of intimidating. It's It was an area that none of us really understood. And within, you know, a year or two of us having a pretty good handle on it, it was just another thing that we carried. And I do believe NDI will eventually integrate that way. It's not turnkey, though. <laughs> it is definitely not turnkey. I have probably spent the greater portion of this year troubleshooting <laughs> and developing internal resources and keeping people from meltdowns because they forgot to change their subnet mask or something. And it's like, yeah. they're actually one really cool thing that Bird Dog has done. So at the beginning of this year, uh, people would change the IP settings on the cameras and then send them back. And there was literally no way for us to access the camera. Oh, um, God. Yeah. So, you know, I talked to their support people and we kind of made jokes about, you know, how much money they could make if they just, you know, 50 bucks to reset the camera. And eventually they've released, it's Windows only, but they've released a thing called the Bird Dog Neuralizer, which basically you just plug it in directly to your Windows computer and you start it, it'll ping the camera, you restart the camera, it pings back and it completely flashes the camera back to its factory uh, default settings. So whatever IP settings people changed or screwed up or forgot to tell us when they sent it back, we can actually resolve all that now really easily. And at first we were talking about making it a customer damage thing because it was just impossible for us to be able to hit that range and know where to find the camera. That's the best thing about working with small companies. It is, it's so like if you're a manufacturer and you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, I wonder how I can get my product on Lens Journal's best of the year you list next year. It's uh, awesome. talk to us. <laughs> yeah. We really like that. Yeah, it's very, very handy. One, it makes us feel cool. And two, it is very helpful for our day to day workflow. Continuing around the virtual table here, we'll move on to Roger. Roger, what is your second pick for your favorite product of the year? Oh, I'm only the only one who likes this one, but it's the Canon RF 800 F11. Um, I do think you're the only one who likes this. It is. It's true. <laughs> I love it and in I, theory. I, I think it's, I, I, it's an ugly I'm good lens. With, I'm good with being the only one who likes it. It's ugly. It's cheap it's plastic. It's an F11. It's F11. <laughs> and I love it because it's different, which is usually enough for me. It gives you adequate 800 millimeter pictures in a fairly inexpensive and very lightweight lens. And you show me the other ways you can do that. There's some zooms that can get to 600 at maybe five, six, and they're not even as good an image quality as this is. It's actually pretty decent. It's, it's nothing that's great. It's just something that was not available. And there is now a tool for me personally. I love it. I go to the beach and there's lots of birds and wildlife and stuff. I can and sun. Huh? 
and it's sun. Fine. Yes. You get lots of light at the beach. I got so tons of sense. light. I could take tons of pictures and I would never carry a, you know, 500 F4 or anything equivalent to that down there. It's not why I'm there. So I think for certain things, it gives you a, an opportunity to use a, a focal length. You just don't get any other way. And to be honest, when I, if you told me I could get 800 millimeters of decent image quality at F11 for 900 bucks, I think that was great. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I guess if you're shooting at the beach, it's almost less effort to have that F11. It's it's not harder. Now, obviously, you're not going to you know do indoor sports or something with it. It's right. got limitations, but you know, to, to th- this is this is an option. I can also get a Canon 800 f/5.6 for around fourteen thousand dollars, and it weighs about ten pounds or eight pounds, and it's four feet long. Uh, this is something I can carry on a hike, and I'm an old man. Yeah, it's pretty compact. So, I think it's a really cool, different thing. It's unique. There's nothing else like it. I always like that. Like you were talking about, I think these are the kinds of things that Nikon maybe should be doing. Yeah. And that maybe like, I think a weird, very niche 800 millimeter F11 lens is a risk Canon can afford to take, but that maybe Nikon can't, or maybe doesn't think they can. You know, if, if anybody but Canon had come out with it, I'd have said they, they farmed the design off to China and, you know, had some third party (laughs) make it for them. Because it wasn't easy design. It's only like, what, seven, eight elements in this lens? Canon doesn't do that. Oh, everybody else does that I'm aware of. But yeah, this is just the kind of thing that's like, why not? It's probably no risk. It, it, they probably won't sell a ton of them, but I bet they sell more of these than Nikon does their 58095. Right. Yeah. Low. Touché. Yeah. <laughs> Low this, reward, this a, I would imagine. Like, even if it's it, successful, it's, it's not going to really like change their financial future. No, but there's probably some idiot like me that goes, you know, I haven't bought a mirrorless camera yet. And well, that 800 F11 is cheap and useful to me. I might buy an R5. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Roger has to get out of here for a meeting. So we will say goodbye to Roger real briefly. We've gone longer than we expected, (laughs) but yeah, we'll, we'll continue the list without you. Well, I can, I can add that I have nothing to say about either of the other products left. I don't know the first <laughs> oh, perfect. Item, so That's I how I felt on. these last two products. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't know what a bird dog P4K was. I thought it was some hunting camera or something. You, know? <laughs> yeah, you could use it for that. Probably so. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Bye. Okay. So we've restarted now. Roger's gone. Uh, we'll move, we'll move back around the table to Zach. Uh, what is your next favorite product? So my next favorite product is, interestingly enough, a product that I have not actually used, but I do have one of the competitors, and it seems like they work pretty much identically to each other, and that is the Quasar Science LED tubes. These are single unit, you know, they look like fluorescent tubes, but they are LED, they're full RGB controlled, they're DMX enabled, they have a ton of effects. and they're battery powered as well as plug in. And the ones that I actually have are the Nanlite uh, Pavo tubes. We have but, one of those too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those we carry both. Oh, perfect. I got them like as full disclosure from the company um, as just something that they thought I might be interested in. And I was extremely skeptical when I first got them, but I use them for everything. And I use them. In a lot of times, things that are completely unrelated to photography as a whole. When I just need a work light, I will use them. I I use them for all sorts of things. My roommate is an actor. When he has to self-tape, I loan him my Pavo tubes for him to use for self-tapes. I use them all the time, and I never expected to use them as often as I do, but it seems like I have them set up constantly. Yeah. When I think of these lights, I picture them on screen. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. people are using them a lot. You don't picture uh, them being used like lightsabers because that's what I see. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's true. <laughs> First that, second, on screen, and as like a practical effect in a music video. Like you're yeah. you're yeah. seeing these lights, which I, I think is a popular way to use them. But I think maybe people go to that first and don't consider them as a light source right. Uh, right. in the same way that you would use just like a panel light or something. And they are super, super helpful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I also love that the, and correct me if I'm wrong and we'll cut this, but neither the Nanlite or the Quasar Science require an app to function. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't I don't know anything about the quasar science, but the Nanlite, like all of the controls are built into the unit. Uh, it's a fairly easy interface, and uh, yeah, it's 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 great. Right when we were getting those in, we went on like a a run where we got the quasar science in the Nanlite Pavo tube and one other. I can't I, remember I, it either. I remember who it was, but I'm not going to say who it was because no. I, well, I don't know. I, I guess there's no reason. Call him out. I'm allowed to complain about a product that we didn't like. Absolutely. Uh, Digital Sputnik. Oh, that the, is who okay. they And right. that app was so clunky. Yes. You had to use an app to do anything on it. And the app was useless. Uh, mm. And we returned it. That's the reason we don't carry it. And it might be better now, but even if it's better, I don't want something that I can only control with an app. Having like some physical buttons on the thing is pretty. Especially when you have competitors that are not that much more expensive and substantially better. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. All right, well, I will wrap us up our our last best product of the year. And I don't have a ton to say about it, I guess, beyond the fact that I really like it a lot is the Canon C500 Mark II. And um I went back and forth with myself a little bit about whether to talk about the C500 Mark II or the C300 Mark III. I've used them both. I like them both a lot. I still shoot really frequently with the C300 Mark II. I think that's one of my like favorite cameras of all time. I really like that's that camera That's a go-to too. for me. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It's a personal preference thing. And, you know, it's it's possible it just comes from having more experience with Canon than with Sony. But I generally prefer to work with the canon sensor i think the colors come out looking better i agree if i were shooting a documentary a c300 mark iii or a c500 mark ii would be go-to choices for me and i debated talking about the c300 mark iii because it has higher frame rate options which i really like for documentary work but but i <laughs> went with the c500 mark ii because i didn't expect to care whether it was a full frame sensor or not and the full frame sensor uh, it really surprised me how much I came to like that. Yeah, look. I'm kind of in the same uh, boat. I I didn't really have high expectations. I didn't really care that it was going to be full frame. But after I spent some time with it, it was like, OK, this is kind of nice. Right. Yeah, I, I've spent too much time talking with customers on the phone about how much it doesn't matter to their pro project, <laughs> whether they're shooting on a full frame or not. I've said like, hey, you can shoot on a GH5, like you can make optical changes and still get a cinematic look and shoot on a smaller sensor. Vlog's awesome. I'm just going to throw that right. out there though. <laughs> but if you're going for a very specific look, I don't know, the the full frame, it, it really it really genuinely does make a difference. It and does. I, I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I still don't know that I would call it mission critical but i do no, agree. i completely agree uh one you know like uh zach said earlier it's with the r5 it's kind of the little things one thing i really really like about the c500 mark ii and also the c300 mark iii because their accessories are interchangeable is the locking efc mount i mm -hmm. think that was so smart because one reason uh i've always shot manual lenses is because the positive lock system, you know, if you want to have any kind of electronics, you're going to pay a crazy amount of money. And, um, but to me, it's more important to have that secure connection between the camera and the lens and make sure that it's a super secure mount and everything else I'm happy to do manually, but Canon kind of solved that. So even though it's such a narrow flange, you, I'm not afraid to put, you know, heavy high-end cinema lenses on it because I can lock that sucker down and feel just as good. Yeah, and I, I think the last time we saw that was the first generation C500, which was a long, long time ago. They sort of abandoned it for a little while during the like C300 Mark II phase. Yeah, and then the C700 happened and they tried to forget both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would definitely pick a C500 Mark II over a C700 any day of the week. Easy decision. Is it because you can actually have a camera live view with the included accessories? Yeah, you can move around with it. And it's, I mean, the swappable, those rear accessories, the extension units and the EVF, you really are able to like kind of customize for your style of shooting, which I think is nice. And it's not as convoluted as say a red modular system. It still stays kind of in a easy to understand, easy to follow Canon ecosystem. But I really like the fact that if you don't shoot with an EVF and you know, let's say you do more studio style shooting instead of having an EVF, you can get the EUVT and have a 
remote B terminal and a direct lens connector for say a 25 to 250. So it really allows you to tailor it to whatever it is that you're shooting, whatever style of shooting you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's modular without being bare bones. And I think that's probably what they actually tried to accomplish with the C700 is to just kind of have an, an every man's camera, but it was too expensive and it was too big. And I think everything they got wrong in that camera system, they got right in the C5, uh, 500 Mark II plus the full frame sensor, which of course on the C700 was a paid upgrade. All right. I think that'll about wrap it up. We've, we've gone long on this one. So yeah, yeah. My dog's if you're still listening, me. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, happy holidays and all that. We'll, uh, we'll do this again next year and hopefully have even more best to talk about. Perfect. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you. Yep, thank you.